What is up, YouTube? This is Red Leprechaun Gaming, and welcome back. Welcome to our third session of Pokemon Veritas, the D&D campaign. Inspired, of course, by the YouTube channel Boarding Party. Please check them out. They are the ones who came up with this. I am simply repurposing it, because I find the idea fascinating. When we left our young hero, Rendmond, he had gotten his first comfortable night's sleep since his hometown was destroyed and everyone he knew killed by the sinister Team Reverence. He is sleeping in the Pokemon Professor Ginkgo's house. And yes, Ginkgo after the Ginkgo tree, because every Pokemon Professor is in fact named after a species of tree. So... What is happening here? Our hero is going to awake. After having one of the best nights of sleep he has had in a long time. Now, for those of you who are not aware, typically in D&D, you do gain benefits from sleep. Oh, ho, ho. you do gain benefits from sleeping in a better bed as opposed to a worse one. And he just rolled a nat 20 for his benefit. So they, they being him and Dusk, since they're both sleeping in a bed, in an actual house, get advantage on their first roll. I know it's not the most generous benefit, but it's the best one I could think of off the top of my head. Okay. So. Our heroes have leveled up. They fought several battles, and they made it all the way from here down to Southstrom Island, which is currently off of the camera right now, and then all the way back up through here and then over to Morinder. That's quite the journey. It took him about three weeks. Well, he was unconscious for a week, so that doesn't really count, but, you know, he made it. And now he's finally going to get some of his questions answered. Or so he hopes. Now, let's see how much luck good old Professor Ginkgo had for procuring supplies from the Pokemart. And they have advantage on this roll. Okay. Not the best. Definitely not the worst. Very lucky they had advantage. Their first roll was like a six. So... Professor Sycamore comes into their room after knocking politely. His little larvitar following behind him. And they have a backpack. And in that backpack are five Pokeballs, four potions, And one of each of those, uh, the cure status things. The medicine you use to cure, like, frozen paralysis, that sort of thing. As well as... Weeks worth of rations for the two of them. Pretty good haul. Could have been better. Could have been a lot better. But, it's what they're starting out with. Now, the professor takes them downstairs, because he wants to run some tests on Dusk. First, he asks her what move she knows, and if she can demonstrate them, which of course she replied yes. So they go to a room that's a little sturdier, and she's going to use Sand Attack. She throws up the spray of sand, nothing unusual there. That's a move Umbreon actually gets. Next... However, she proceeds to use Ember, and a small bead of fire slams into the wall of his room, whatever room they're doing this in. He takes, he pays close attention to the rings of color around her that have become the color of fire, and they almost seem to flare and flicker as she uses her fire type attack. And lastly, she bites down on the leg of a chair. 
actually putting some serious dents in it. Very interesting. So, Dusk here is still able to utilize Dark-type moves. However, Bite is not a move Umbreon usually learns. As far as I'm aware, she can't even learn it from TMs. So, that suggests that not only her typing has changed, but her entire moveset. As for what her typing is now, obviously Fire-type is part of it. He just rolled a 19 to figure out what was up with her. Taking a single hair from her, he examines it under a microscope. Fascinating. As you know, most microscopes use light to determine what something is. Yes, of course, that's common knowledge. Says Renfend. He is talking to the professor. As is Dusk. Take a look at this under the microscope. What are you doing? George. Uh, as he turns the light of the microscope on, the ethereal purple colors of the hair shift. It's almost like when a pupil dilates and it becomes like fainter almost clear. It's like, what does that mean? Well, take a look at this. And he pulls out a purple tissue sample and puts it under the light, under the microscope. And it does the same exact thing when exposed to light. What's this a tissue sample of? This is a tissue sample from a Gengar. Now, if we go over here, and he goes over to this table, and there is this basic clamp attached to the table. You know, the metal clamps, they bolt to the table. You screw and unscrew them to tighten them. And he puts the hair in the clamp, tightens it all the way. What are you doing? Stay away from the charging cord. Fred, George. Where's the spray bottle? Be gone! I said be gone! Upstairs with you. Okay, now that we've taken over the taking care of the real life Umbreons. He clamps the hair all the way. It is now held in place by these clamps. He then grabs the top of it and with very little effort pulls it sideways through the solid metal of the clamp leaving the hair perfectly untouched. Your Umbreon is a fire and ghost type. How is that possible? That's a cock dice. Whatever that machine was doing, you said it had some kind of tanks attached to it? My guess is that at least one of the things in one of those tanks was a dusk stone. And I'd bet money that there was also a fire stone in there. But Umbreon's already evolved. Yes. This isn't evolution per se. Whatever this is wasn't natural. But somehow, using these evolutionary stones, Umbreon here was forced to change her typing. Why they changed Dusk's typing, I don't know. Likely because you said they took specifically Umbreon. 
Yeah. Eevee is one of the most adaptable Pokemon in the entire world. It has more evolutions than any other Pokemon in the entire world. It's possible that this process would only work on a Pokemon that is able to adapt to such a rapid change. I mean, if you put a Pikachu or a Lotad in it, there's no telling what would happen. The excess power might simply kill the Pokemon outright. Beyond that, I really can't say. You say the machine was destroyed, yes. Along with most of the facility. That's probably for the best. Whatever this is, this isn't something Team Reverence should have. Now, what are you going to do? As I said, I don't really have any plans. You mentioned something about the gyms? Yes, not only might the gym leaders know a bit about these respective typings, perhaps even more than I do, but you're going to draw far less attention if you are a Pokemon trainer traveling the routes attempting to earn all of the badges. You said they don't know what you look like. Well, if you have an entire team of Pokemon, you know, the gyms, they do not disclose to the public what happens in their gym other than the results. If you win, or if you beat another trainer in an official match, that is recorded. But little else. They're not going to report what kind of Pokemon you have until later into the contest itself. And even then, they would only report it as an Umbreon. That's as specific as the stats get, so that people can't target specific players. Besides, if you challenge the gyms, you are going to get stronger. And that can only help you against Team Reverence. Well, I obviously can't go battling around with Dusk here. Yeah, purple Umbreon with flames on its back. Rings of fire, if you will. Is enough to draw attention from wild Pokemon, then how much attention is it going to draw walking down a route or battling a trainer? That is true. I have a thought on that. As you are aware, Morinder has a fairy. This fairy goes to Veridonia, and from Veridonia to Elation. I am not suggesting you take this fairy, not yet. You are not ready for that gym. Although the gyms do tend to... Uh, what do you want? What? I literally just gave you a whole can of cat food. Stupefy! For those of you who have not seen my videos, my cat is not afraid of the water that comes out of a spray bottle. It is afraid of the noise. So I trained them to respond to the Harry Potter spell Stupefy by also making the noise this thing makes whenever I say it. So, now if I point at one of them and say the spell, they will run away. Fourth wall breaking. The gyms will adjust themselves to you based on how far you've come. But I would advise waiting to take the challenge in Alicia. That is a notoriously difficult gym. What I suggest is that you take Route 404 down to the docks where the ferry is, and head under the docks. A lot of water type Pokemon hang out around there. And since you can speak to Pokemon, as roughly 10% of the population can, 
here in Veritas. I believe you will find someone willing to help you. They might not be the strongest, but I highly doubt that there would not be a water type that are willing to help you. That's the guy, guys. Well, I guess you're a fire type now, so having a water type couldn't hurt. I'll have to keep Dusk in her Pokeball. We can't risk her being seen out on the streets. Fortunately, there should be many Team Rocket grunts that actually know what I look like. I doubt any of the ones at the lake survived. I'll have to sneak down there before I leave the city. Thank you for giving me everything, Professor. No problem. And, uh... I suggest you take Vestaville City first. They have already presumed that you have gone past there, as you said yourself. And, uh, if you do me a favor, you make sure my daughter made it there all right? Of course. What's her name? Verona. Very well. She's there. I'll tell her that you were concerned. Oh, and she knows, if not as much about Pokemon as me, close. And uh, she's very interested in them. Likely she could help you. If nothing else, to become stronger, to become a better trainer. Well, considering I've fought a handful of wild Pokemon in the entirety of my life, two of which were with a stick, I, uh, I could probably use that. I would suggest heading out to the docks as soon as possible. If you leave the city today, you should make a lot better time going to Vestaville than cutting through the countryside. They won't recognize you, and you might even meet some trainers that you can uh, train up whatever Pokemon you catch at the docks. Here's hoping there's someone willing to help. Making his way out of the house, casually this time, instead of through a window, as to not draw suspicion, our young hero rolls a nat 20 on his stealth check, Umbreon in Pokeball. He walks past anyone wearing those Bluetooth devices that Team Reference wears and quickly realizes they were only on the outside of the town. Evidently, Team Reverence is not yet powerful enough to take over entire cities by force. It's probably just because Costborn was so remote that they were able to attack it. It takes about an hour and a half, two hours, for him to get to the docks. Route 404 is relatively small, there aren't many people on it yet, just the dock workers. And having rolled a second nat 20 on his stealth check, he makes it under the bridge, the dock for the ferry, without any issue whatsoever. The ferry itself is not there yet. It stays docked by Varian City on Verdonia Island, in case there's any need of evacuation. It won't make its first trip for an hour or two yet. It's early in the morning. He walks out through sand, 
Some bits of trash, not too much. The Grimer keep the city relatively well cleaned up. And makes his way down to the water line. There are some tide pools, some rocks. The tide is currently pretty low. Whether it will remain that way for much longer, he does not know. Although he is rolling pretty well so far. Crouching down by the water, using his ability to speak to Pokemon, he whispers, I need help. Is there anyone who would be willing to help me reach Vestavilla? This is a matter of life and death. It takes a while. Let's see exactly who responds with our percentile dice. Okay. Interesting. Out of the water emerges a small bump. The water bunches upward as if a small fish is swimming just under the surface. And the surface is directly in front of him. In front of him is a small magenta-colored fish in the shape of a heart. Roughly the size of his hand. It's a love disc. Hello, the love disc says in a cheerful voice. My name is Sol. You said you needed help? Yes. There are some dangerous people after me and... I can't exactly use my main Pokemon in public at the moment. I need someone who can help me reach Vestavilla. I am not very old, and I am not very strong. I have never left the safety of this pier. And I would very much like to see the rest of Veritas. You'll take me with you? Yes. Will I get strong? And will I see the world? Well, I suppose that depends entirely on whether we survive the trip to Vestavilla. I will help you. Do you have a Pokeball? I can't exactly, uh, we can survive for periods of time on land, but we are at home in the water. Of course, and he pulls out one of the five Pokeballs that he was, uh, given by the professor. And, uh, taking these percentile dice... Now, he does have a very high chance of this working because the Pokemon actively wants to go with him. Oh, wow. And he rolled a 92, so he definitely catches this. The Love Disc cheerfully pecks the little circle in the center of the Pokeball. It expands, and a little red light comes out. And the Love Disc goes inside. It blinks once. Twice. Three times. And with a click, our young hero Renman has his second Pokemon. Stealthily making his way out of the city, avoiding the professor's house this time as to not draw attention to it, he exits Morinder to Route 403. No one even pays him a second mind. He's just another trainer. And the camera fell down. <laughs> Let's hope that didn't mess with the 
feel with the orientation of the camera. It is slightly more stable. I have propped it up with a tiny pen. Obviously, traveling on Route 403 is a hell of a lot easier than trekking through the wilderness. It's not long before our hero starts seeing wild Pokemon, although they're nowhere near the ferocious ones that he was running to in the middle of the wilderness. A couple flying types, some grass types, some ground types, you know, nothing too out of the ordinary. Some bug types. Let's see... What happens? On this route, on this first day of travel, he runs into a young boy. He is 10 years old, by the looks of him, and he has a single Pokeball on his belt. Hi, mister. Um, are you a Pokemon trainer? Yes. Um, would you like to battle with me? You just got your starter? Yeah. Which one did you pick? Why don't you find out? I, uh, I haven't had a chance to battle with him yet. We've just been training out in the woods. Would you like to battle with me? Sure. But I can only use one of my Pokemon. That's fine. I only have one. And let the first real trainer battle of the entire series commence. As this kid sends out, as I grab the percentile dice again. This kid sends out a Chikorita. And of course, Renmond sends out Soul. A grass type, huh? She says. Well, this is quite the first challenge. Yeah. You wanted your fill of battling. This will definitely be a good test of how powerful you are. You can speak to Pokemon, huh? You can't? No. You must be lucky to be able to tell what your Pokemon are saying. Definitely helps with naming them. <laughs> Our little friend goes first. I already forgot the kid's name. We'll call him Ricky. Ricky's Chikorita goes first. Ooh, and he just... He, Love Disc has, like, hardly any AC because it's a Love Disc. I mean, it it's not terrible because, you know, it is small, so it's not the easiest thing to hit, but he hit directly on his armor class. Chikorita, gonna use Vine Whip, which is super effective. Thankfully, this is a level 5 Chikorita. Ooh. Soul takes a whopping 10 points of damage from that. Soul's down to 5 HP. As my cats tackle each other into the kitchen again. And Love Disc is going to use Charm. That is where I'm going to end this episode, because we're almost at half an hour. So I'll see you guys in the next video. Until then, have fun, guys.